So I should confess that asteroids is not really fully my topic. So Kwanshi was supposed to be here and do this and so much of the notebook that we'll be seeing later was written by him. Uh, I have made some additions to that and machine learning was something that I wanted to cover but then we realized that we cannot have both asteroids and machine learning in a one hour thing. So what I'm going to do is in the talk I'm going to cover a little bit of asteroids and a little bit of machine learning and in the notebook we will mainly do the asteroids but we will see how we are starting to use machine learning to make the process more efficient. And it won't be just asteroids but it will be specifically near earth asteroids that we will be looking at. It was good that Melissa in her talk um, did mention an asteroid and light curve and so on. What we will see with near earth asteroids is that we do not get the standard light curves the way we get them for asteroids. And then I will bring in as I said a little bit of machine learning. So let us start with the diagram that we see here. This is typically a picture that many of you may be familiar with because what you are seeing here is the main belt of asteroids. It is between Mars and Jupiter and most of the asteroids that we know about are there. But then that whole thing is a very small section in this bigger diagram where we go to the outer planets. And that entire thing which to many is the main solar system is really a small part here with this big thing being the Oort cloud from which all the comets seem to come and that whole thing in fact is a very small portion here and it is not really well seen here but this is the orbit of one of the outer smaller bodies Sedna. So you can see how huge really the solar system is and the asteroids form a small part. But what we are really going to concentrate upon is in fact going inward towards the earth and that is what we will start seeing. So this is something from the minor planet center. This is how the outer solar system is and you will see an animation here. The orbits that you are seeing are not the inner planets but we are starting there from Jupiter. And so many of these, uh, most of these asteroids that you are seeing are trans-Neptunian objects. So they are far out there. We are not really seeing the innermost ones. And the blue thing is that you see here are in fact comets. And clearly there is something wrong with the animation because all the comets simultaneously seem to come in. The sky will be fabulous, fantastic if that happened. But I think they need to be phased out. But other than that, that does indicate how many comets we know about, how many trans-Neptunian objects there are and so on. And as you move inside, now we start seeing the inner planets in this again from the MPC another animation based on real objects. So here now you start seeing the main belt asteroids but also now you see that there are many many objects inside that main belt asteroid that are uh, coming closer to the earth and those are the ones that we need to study a lot because they can be hazardous and they are the ones that can pose a lot of issues. And so if you really zoom in in the inner solar system then what you start seeing is closer to earth what these objects are doing, right. And now these are the inner planets, this being Mars here and this being earth here. So you can see that there are so many objects that are really crossing the earth's orbit. And you should remember that most of them are planar, not all but most of them because of the way the dynamics works. And so that is something that we need to be aware of, that is something that we need to have a good count of and that is where surveys like ZTF now being in the survey mode can help us get a large number of them. So now concentrating really on the orbit of the earth where what is shown here is a, this is earth here. So these are bodies that are really coming close to the earth. So again just different depictions of the same set of things but as we get closer we can see that constantly this activity is going on and this is from 2008 and to note here are so the objects that you see are named here. So you have you will be able to look at these bodies and later on when we are looking at the notebook we go through one single particular asteroid and then you go through various things with that particular asteroid. But it will be a good idea then to substitute that with some of these asteroids and see what you get for them because each of them will give you the kind of thing that we are looking for in the notebook later on. Okay, And so you are aware of the dangers from asteroid. What is shown here is the Lonar Lake which is not far from Mumbai. How many of you have been to Lonar? Only a few. So it's something like a weekend's journey from here, make a point to go there. It's a fantastic astronomical event that happened there and you can sample, get into the lake. Oh, the lights were turned off right anyway. <laughs> so make sure that you go there because that's the nearest big crater-like event that you can see happening. Tunguska, you know, uh, Chelyabinsk Bolide from 2013, not 
far back. Here, about a thousand people were heard. None of them directly because of the bolide, but when they heard the boom, they got close to some windows and the windows shattered and it's a glass that hurt them really. So an indirect impact, but those things can happen too. And of course, you all know about what happened to the dinosaurs long, long back and they had an astronomy club too that didn't last long. We want our astronomy clubs to last long. So we have to get into finding all these asteroids, making sure we know their orbits and so on. So that's a little bit that we are going to be seeing. Right? The other thing that happened just a day or two back, one of NASA's spacecraft has reached the asteroid Bennu and it's going to be parked there for some time, not parked really, but go around it. It's going to be orbiting that. It's only a 500 meter body. And then in a couple of years, uh, so it started in 2016, reached there in 2018 until 2020 or so, it's going to be there. And what it's going to do at that time is that it's going to put down, and this is obviously an artist's depiction, we don't have a photograph from there. Uh, it's going to have this small vacuum pump. It's going to use it to pull up some material, only about 60 grams. That's all that it's going to do, but there's going to be a huge thing. So the biggest chunk that has been returned before was hand delivered from the moon twice. But since then, only a small amount is on its way back. So there is a Japanese mission that's on its way back and there's another one uh, that's happened before this particular one. So again, remember these names, Bennu, Hayabusa and Ryugo. You can also use these names later on to substitute in the notebook and try to see if you can locate these asteroids in any ZTF images. I have not tried that, that's your exercise. So what you may have to do is that there are some date ranges that we have used in the notebook. You may have to play around a little bit with those notebook dates also in order to get that. And again, there are limits that we have put in the notebook like magnitude 20. ZTF goes up to about 20.5. We were erring on the better side and went up to 20. These may be fainter than that. You can find that out from MPC. There are some links in the notebook that you can use for that. But so all that will be an open exercise kind of thing. So surveys for asteroids. Right, we need to, again, again, what we are concentrating here are the near earth asteroids and there are several thousand that are known and these are the different observatories or surveys that have been looking specifically for asteroids. ZTF does not do that but because we have a large field and we cover the sky a very large number of times, we will keep on seeing it again and again, seeing many of them again and again. So here for instance what you see is that uh, Catalina Sky Survey and Panstas, those are the ones that have been finding most of the asteroids but there are many other surveys that also contribute to that. So you heard that Bennu is going to bring back a sample, but the cheapest return of a sample is when you can predict that an asteroid is going to enter the Earth's atmosphere, it breaks apart, you know where it is going to go, you can actually go and get that. So in 2008 that happened, it was the 2008 TC3, we were able to predict that it's going to enter the Earth's atmosphere and then it broke up over Sudan and we were able to say where it was going to go and actually samples were collected from that. So instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars, you can spend a slightly smaller amount on a survey, be able to predict these and be able to get that. We are not always lucky because uh, we need to be able to get the entire range of these at smaller and smaller details. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, do they really need to have a survey? So in order to find this asteroid, they already fallen on Earth. They are going to fall on Earth. Uh, do they really need to have a survey? Uh, survey because they, they can predict the plasma. Yeah, it may be too late, right? What we want to do is that we want to know about these asteroids well before they will get to Earth. So Bennu, for instance, right? So it is something that is going to get very close to Earth in, in about 160 years. It keeps coming very close by, but that is expected to be a likely possible impact date and so on. And so NASA went out of its way to tell people, make them aware that by getting the spacecraft close to it, it is not changing the orbit so that it will either make it come faster towards Earth and so on. So we definitely need to know all these things way ahead. If one, once you see, see the flash, it's going to be too late. And so one can do something like this. So what happens though then is that with something like ZTF, we find a large number of these asteroids. Many of them are known, many of them are new. And then so as you will see in the notebook, given a particular night and given a particular asteroid, you can say which images contain these asteroids. 
But there are also many other things that can look like these nearby asteroids. So there are, for instance, um, satellites which leave much longer trails. There are cosmic rays which also, so a cosmic ray if it is incident directly on your receiver, you are going to see a single hot pixel and that is what most of you may be aware of by looking at images. But if there is a grazing incidence of a cosmic ray, then it leaves a line. But it is slightly different from a typical image of say an asteroid because the cosmic ray just like, why is it a single pixel? Because it is a very high energy event and it is not really affected by the Earth's atmosphere. Whereas all the other photons that are coming in, you have a point spread function for them. So even the grazing cosmic ray, when you have a linear thing, it's going to be only one or maybe two pixels wide. Whereas the other things that we see, say the satellite trails, are like PSF. So you can separate them that way. Then there are also glints. There is a lot of space junk. And that space junk can also leave short trails, which can mimic uh, to be like uh, near Earth asteroids. And so what happens is that in, say, ZTF, we have these tens of thousands of streak-like events. And then typically, human scanners look at these. So every morning, these are well subtracted. So the contrast is very high. and It's not very difficult. So you've got a streak. Um, an algorithm looking for streaks and then it makes these different images and you go there and start looking at it. But looking at tens of thousands of these is still not a good thing because your eyes will get tired, you may miss some. And that is why going into machine learning and letting a machine decide what is what is going to be a great thing and we are already there. So that's some of the steps that we'll be looking at it. ZTF does have a separate pipeline for asteroids. So early on what happens is that those two things separate out. So the point source like objects uh, get looked at separately and asteroids including the streaking asteroids get looked at separately. So for all these streaking things, how do you first of all identify the streaks and once you identify the streaks, try to figure out whether it is due to a near earth asteroid or not. So what you can do is that you can assign specific parameters to each of these streaks and use the values of those parameters to try to separate them into these different classes. And so this is one of the things that uh, you can see where machine learning can come in because the machine needs to be given very specific rules and it will follow the rules no matter what. The rules may be good, the rules may be bad, they may be simple, they may be complex, but whatever it is told, it's going to do that. That's why you have to be very careful what you tell. And for many, many applications, you need a good labeled set. And there is supervised and unsupervised classification or machine learning. We'll see a little bit about that. So here's an example. This has nothing to do with asteroids, but this is a simple, nice example. All these are stars, and these are two different types of quasars. So you can see that the stars in our galaxy form a nice cluster. And then you can ask, a couple of simple questions. There is line one here and there is line two here. You can ask whether the object that you are looking for is above line one or below line one. That is one decision you are making. And that separates your data set into two. And then you are looking for quasars, so possibly you are looking for objects below line one. And then you ask, there is this line two. Again, these are these below line two or above line two? So two decisions that allows you to decide whether it's a star, quasar of one type or quasar of another type, right? So you need not have only two decisions. There can be 10 different decisions. Is it a streak or not? If it is a streak, how thick it is, how long it is, and then do you see some object nearby, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what you do is that given all these different possible decisions, you can, with many decision trees, you can construct different decision subsets. So out of the 10 possible decisions, you use only five decisions at a time. And which five decisions you use? you can choose a random sample of those. So essentially, you are forming a set of different trees. And because it is now a set of trees, it tends to co be called a forest. And because you are randomly choosing which decisions to make for a given set, it becomes a random forest. So this is one of the simpler but very powerful algorithms. So you have many decisions to make. You choose subsets of those decisions, have a lot of them. And then together, you make an ensemble of those and get to the results. And this is an example of a machine learning algorithm. So that you can do from your domain knowledge. So whatever you know about these objects, right? So we know from observations where the quasar should lie. There are more complex lines that are here, which I have not shown. But we know from observations that the stars lie. These are two features that I'm using. I did not use the word feature so far. But what I mentioned with asteroids, the length, the width, etc., those are features. Here, the features are slightly more complex. But you have been doing sky observations, so you possibly know. I've used three different filters here. G minus R is one color. 
R minus I is another color. I know what the color of star should be. I know what the color of quasar should be. So that allows me to define the lines. And so again, whatever your problem is based on that, you can define. And they need not be lines, by the way. It can be more complex, of course. Right? Those can be surfaces, manifolds, based on how many features that you have. And so what we have is that if once we start using mathematics, statistics, and computer science, the combination of that is machine learning. So machine learning is a keyword. Is it's a buzzword should be aware of that. But what you should strive to do is go beyond machine learning to data science. And in data science, what you also bring together is domain specific knowledge. Because once you bring domain specific knowledge, then you are really bringing an edge to the machine learning. Otherwise, machine learning is simply putting together a data set, clean data set, use standard set of algorithms and do something. So many times you'll find that trivial correlations are found by that. Correlations that everyone knows about, or maybe sometimes even wrong may be found. But the moment you bring in a little bit of domain knowledge, you get an age and you can do far better. So try to keep that in mind when you apply machine learning. And uh, if you go to scikit-learn, which is one of the standard Python package, then you'll see this diagram explained there. There are many flavors of machine learning. And this describes when to use clustering, when to use classification, when to use regression, and when dimensional reduction may be needed. Because if you have a very large number of features, suppose you've got 70 features, then you are essentially dealing in a 70 dimensional space. And that's not a very good thing. Because what happens there is that the curse of dimensionality is the following. If you consider, consider for a second that this room is a cube, right? And if you take 90% of dimensions of, uh, for each of the three dimensions, can take the volume that is covered by 90%, 90 times 90 plus times 90 divided by 100 times 100 times 100. That's a large enough fraction. But as the dimensions grow, you will see that 90 to the power n and 100 to the power n, that difference starts increasing. By the time you reach even 6 or 7, your 90% of volume is really, really a small volume compared to the 100% of the volume. And so when you reach a very large number, what you're doing is that you are sampling a really small part of it. So you have a huge space, and you, are, you do not have a handle on that. So what is very crucial is that when you have large dimensionality, try to find some way of bringing that down. Try to figure out which of those n dimensions are less useful, contributing less to your classification or to your science, and bring it down. That is one of the crucial things that you need to remember. So again, for the streaks, having three or four different things is an excellent thing. And so some examples of uh, supervised learning, that whenever you have discrete classes, you can do that. So prediction of future cases or knowledge extraction, compression, all those can be done. Regression is used when you have a continuous set of things. Consider masses or temperatures. When you have those kinds of things rather than discrete classes, you'll be using regression. And then there are many, many algorithms uh, like Naive, support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, random forests, etc. Then there is unsupervised learning, where you don't necessarily have labels, and you're trying to figure out how many classes there are. So you are grouping similar instances. And the algorithms there are k-means clustering, db scan, self-organizing map, t-SNE. There's a more recent one called UMAP. So there are many, many of these that you can start using. The good thing these days is that there are fantastic libraries out there. So you don't have to write your own code for these. If you're a CS person, you're a CS scientist, you invent new things, you write a lot of new code, and so on. But if you simply want to do an application, you can go out there, use these libraries, and be able to do fantastic things. The one thing to remember for machine learning is that most of these algorithms are very hungry for data, and they need good data, good labeled data. If you don't have good data, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. And many people don't care, but you should. A lot of effort is spent in cleaning and collecting the samples. So as I said, tens of thousands of streaks are looked at every morning. And from that, then we collect samples that are good, put them aside, and then use those for the machine learning training. These are examples of how things can go bad. These do seem to be streaks, but maybe there is a star on this. There is a very bright star nearby. Part of it is uh, occulted by bright pixels or bad pixels, and then something strange has happened here, etc. So what happens is that there are a few labels and tutorials. What that can do is that you can have a few tens per category. And then you can use some kind of annotations. And I'll give you one example of that to try to get a few thousands of examples then. And that is what is going to be then useful for a machine learning training set. And once you have that, then you can do machine learning and you can extract knowledge from the data that you have. And then that can be used for existing and future data. 
So one of the things that we wanted to do in fact is to get into deep learning with uh, asteroids, streaking asteroids. And so we devised a Zooniverse module where we had these several different classes. And this was early part of the ZTF when there was a lot of noise and there were a lot of glitches that you could see. Many of them, many of these classes have been removed. But then these things were shown and then people were asked to classify things into these different classes. And once that was done, we got this large data set which had these lots of uh, labels in them which could be used later on. And so the types of things that we had uh, included all these things and we allowed people to skip as well. And what we are really interested in was really one class, but in order to get to that class, we wanted to be sure what all contaminations are possible and have labels of that. Sometimes it's easy to simply say that I want this and everything else goes into one bin, but sometimes it's not possible because there are enough distinctions between the two and some subset of the garbage can look a little bit like what you're looking for. So those things, again, domain knowledge becomes very important and you make sure that you have people in the loop who know about the problem itself. So the current status is that the candidate rate is after streak fitting and machine learning is roughly one per square degree, but the false positive rate per night is about 10,000. So you still have to look at tens of thousands to get to one degree. And I'm not talking of the machine learning part, but just the number that is found. With machine learning, you can do it more crucially and be able to get rid of those 10,000s almost uh, straight away. And in September, for instance, there were confirmed five to 20 per month, unconfirmed a few more. And then single sighting, there are many of those, some of these could be satellites with shorter trails and so on. But that is improving as time passes. So a quick primer on deep learning, which is what we are now using for the streaks. You have these input images and you take small sections of it. There is a specific kernel of this kind. So you figure out when you apply this kernel to here, one is looking for ones which are along diagonals and zeros on the side. So one is looking for things that may be a little cross-like and then you what this indicates is that there are a large number of these kernels which are looking for some very specific things, vertical edges, horizontal edges, maybe just boundaries and so on. And a combination of these then gives you this set. Then there is pooling that happens. So let's see this animation here. What I'm doing is that on this image, I'm using this weight kernel to create new layer here. So the first three are convolved with these three to get a single number. The next three are convolved with the same set to get the same number and so on. So this 429 comes about by taking this diagonal and putting them together, etc. And then what happens after that is that this pooling layer, I can do a two by two, either averaging or binning or some such function to reduce the dimensions of these images. Because what, what's happening is that when you have a large number of images, all these calculations can become very expensive to do with a computer. And then you can have a second convolutional layer and then you can do an additional pooling. So what this is essentially doing, at the second layer now, it is combining the initial things that you had, which were just edges or diagonals, into higher level structures. And many times you can have a third layer. In fact, bigger companies like Google and Facebook use a large number of layers. And that is where the word deep comes in. So it is like the last part here, which are fully connected, are like the older ANNs or the neural networks that you may have heard of. And the deep part comes from the depth of this where you have got large number of uh, convolutional layers. And there are, of course, additional things that go in where how you use a softmax and so on. We won't be able to go into that. But the main thing to remember is that starting from the images, there are specific kernels which look for simpler structures. In later layers, we go to more complex structures. And it is those complex structures that then one is trying to classify. So you may have heard of this example of cats and dogs. And what happens there is that in the random forest, what we did, or the question that you asked, how do you draw those lines? The features were defined by humans or based on domain knowledge. Whereas in case of deep learning, it comes up with features on its own. And this can be millions of features. And in that very large dimensional space, it tries to figure out which are the features that can separate the classes that you are interested in. So the older one was where you start with input, there is feature extraction, you have these features, and then you apply traditional ML algorithms. This includes SVMs, random forests, and related ones. And then you get an output. And here what happens is that there is input, there is deep learning flow. So all these things are really combined, and you get output. So what happens here? is that the promise is that these things work better, but also 
this pitfall that it is a blacker box. So, you need to understand what is going on. You may not be able to understand every time, but you need to make an attempt to do that, because that is where how good. So, many times you will be able to apply it again, what I said before, but being aware of whether it is doing a good job is an important thing, especially in science. So, the way we have constructed this deep learning flow for uh, streaking asteroids is that there is a streak finder at the top, and we use two different uh, networks, deep networks. One is called a VGG, which is a few layers, whereas ResNet, which has far more layers. So, you have a streak finder. We separate artifacts and streaks using one network uh, at the top, and then the streaks are then separated into long streaks, many of which will be satellites. So, they go here, and then short streaks. And then among the short streaks, we use a third network to separate them into NEOs, which we are after, and others, which could include, say, cosmic rays and glints. So, here are two examples. For, for instance, this one is an NEO that was found by this deep network, which the humans had missed. So, remember the fatigue that you go through if you look at tens of thousands of images. So, this was an excellent example, this real NEO that the humans had missed, but the machine was able to find. Here is another example of an NEO which humans also missed. And in fact, this is more interesting, because this is something that was seen after 10 years. So, for the last 10 years, it had been missing. And one fine morning, the machine was able to find it. So, again, great thing. So, we have been finding these again and again. Right now, there are still little things that we need to fix. But otherwise, the deep network, this three layer network is not three layer, but three stage network is doing as well as humans in almost all the cases and also better in some cases. So, that is where right now, but again, the interpretability is important. So, let us go on to the notebook now. The notebook is the streak recovery. What we are going to do is that we are going to have a specific asteroid, a specific date range, and in that date range, we are going to figure out if that asteroid is on the ZTF images, and if so, we, we will try to extract that. So, there is a, a file there called run merged. Uh, I do not know if it has been untarred. Igor, so we have the tar file there, right, not untarred. So, I had provided the tar. So, that is one thing that you will have to do. And these are the kind of pre processing things that many times you have to do. We will need an untarred version of the file. So, you will have to untar that, the run merged thing. And then there is a check. FMO.txt. So, these are the three things that you will have there. And then the question that we are asking is that which near earth asteroids appear on ZTF images? That is the basic question, that is the main question that we are after. Now, the answer may be that there are several, because this list exists with the minor planet center. And the answer to the first question may be there are a large number of these. But then sometimes what will can happen is that some of these may be too faint, some of them may lie roughly in gaps, or there could be other reasons. So, the other question is how many of these are actually detected? And then once you find which ones are detected, then you will go ahead and plot some of those or extract the images of those. So, some of the things that you need to do is understand the code in the notebook, because it has many interactions with MPC, and the MPC has been organically grown in terms of the formats that it has. So, there is a little bit of text munging that goes on. The formats are somewhat quirky. They are not the standard CSV like files that you, for instance, saw in the previous one. They are still formatted, but the format itself may be somewhat strange than usual things that you may have come across. And the notebook has some details about that. Then, what you may want to do is that some of the asteroids that I mentioned in the talk, you may want to look at those after you have gone through the entire notebook. So, go through the entire notebook, understand the code, and only then you can go ahead and make those changes. The thing to again remember is that, so the change that you will be making, suppose you want to go after Bennu, then you will change the asteroid that we have named there, uh, from there to Bennu. But the dates that we have mentioned, that also you will have to experiment with, because we have set it so that the asteroid mentioned in the notebook for those dates, you get a good answer for that. For Bennu, for the same dates, you may not get that. You may get that, who knows. But again, when you experiment, do not feel bad if at the first instance you do not get anything. You may have to do a little bit of experiments. And some of the other asteroids that I mentioned too. The other thing is that then you may want to change the variables that are in the notebook and experiment with that a little bit. Change the brightness level and see what that does or the definition of near earth asteroid, how far you are defining. If you relax that a little bit, how many more do you start seeing, whether they also leave streaks or not. Then one of the things that we are doing is rate of motion for asteroids. You can also make changes to that and see the limits to that and see what you get. 
And then you may also want to improve the code in the notebook. Again, the formatting that is there, it's somewhat explicit in terms of what columns should you pick, pick and so on. But you may want to write some definition instead of the code that is directly in the notebook and see how you can improve those things. And that is an important part also of refactoring the code, making it better so that it becomes more marketable. You can convert that into a module kind of thing, not just some definitions and put it somewhere together. The very last cell, for instance, has some issue. Find out what that issue is. It may not show the correct asteroid image every time. So this is how it will show up as sometimes. But why that comes about, you have to figure out in the code where that comes about. And if you can figure out how to change that so that every time, in fact, the correct asteroid image shows up, that will be great. So those are the questions that we'll have. Again, the names that we had were Bennu, Hayabusa, and Ryugu. Again, go through the entire notebook first before attempting to do this. And then there were a few others that I mentioned which were shown in one of the animations. So we can come back to that later on, but there are these. Okay, I think that is all that I had in terms of that. And so let's go to the notebook and go through that. Yeah, that's a good point, yes. So this is actually, this was an example. What happens is that the way the whole thing flows is that those weights settled and the, the kernels get defined based on the input data that you have. You start with random, yes, yeah, yeah. And in fact, there are many interesting issues that come up because of that, yes. Right, to start with you can define randomly or in a specific way, but then the network itself decides based on the input images what are the best kernels to have to define that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So what happens is that the more layers you have, the more weights there are going to be, right? And if you do not have enough data, the network is going to overlearn what you are giving and it starts acting like a lookup table, which is not a good thing. So for instance, what can happen is that for a given example, it can find a path and taking only that path to the output. What you need to have is that you need to have a lot of superimposition of the different images to have real distinction between those. Otherwise, it's going to perform really well on the training data and really horribly on the real data. You don't want that to happen. And what happens many times though is that think of uh, the big data set that is out there, something called ImageNet. There are a million images there. You may not have that many. So if you have a million images which are very large, say 512 by 512, then each pixel is like a dimension that corresponds to some weight in some sense. And so there you can have several layers. But if you don't have that kind of data, then you have to be careful and it's better to have smaller depths. Any other questions? So GPUs are best. But some of these things, if the network is small enough, a CPU would also be fine. So sometimes what you could do is that train on GPU where more cycles are needed. And once the network is trained, you have got settled weights. All that you are doing is reading those weights in and seeing where they put the input image to. So that can many times be done on a CPU too. So the bigger your net, uh, network, the more computing power it's going to need. Okay, shall we move on to the notebook then? Okay, so what I'll do is that I won't go through solving the cells of the notebook, but still I'd like to go through the net notebook uh, to point out a few things. Here we have got several imports. This also includes import warnings. It is a package that you may want to import, but sometimes what people do is that they advise this package to turn off warnings. I would advise not doing that. The warnings exist for a specific reason. And if you turn off the warnings, you don't know what is going wrong, why it is going wrong. So don't turn off warnings. Whatever warning is being given, pay attention to that, even if it is not an error. Because there are errors and there are warnings. So errors will stop you, warnings won't stop you. 
but still there is something happening. Sometimes there may be simply something like you need to upgrade this because it is deprecated. It is still important because down the line it is going to not have any support and it may not work. Today it works, but may not work. Okay, so we will come to the specific step that uh, Igor mentioned, but what we are going to do, this notebook involves a couple of steps where we go out to the web and download something. So you may find that some of those steps are slow. There is one step where some computing and printing happening, so that may be a bit slow. So if it takes several seconds, that is fine. So what we are going to do is that we are going to retrieve a file from the minor planet center and then there are some commands and look at the notebook after meaning you, after you run it for the code where there can be improvements, there are several places where we can be improving things, especially when where the formatting is involved. And so this is this 2018 CL is what we are looking at and that is mainly because it was the first NEA found by ZTF. And that is why the dates that you will find are early on in ZTF, not some of the recent dates. These are the dates that we will be using again for that particular object these are fine when you change the object you may want to experiment with this and note here that we are looking at only one day because even in that day there is a lot of data. So the other reason why we need machine learning is just the volume of the data how big it is. And so we have this MPC primary this is what I mentioned about the format that you will see in the minor planet center stuff you have epochs in specific format and the dates in specific formats. Yeah, go ahead. You want to do it here or? Okay. So if you're using an old version of Astro Query, you have to update the um, you have to update the uh, this URL, and this way you can do it in your notebook, and then you don't have to change the code yeah. in the library. Thank you. Right. So make sure that you make this change before uh, proceeding, and I'll hold on here for a minute more. Okay, so another instance where there is a lot of formatting involved here. So this is where we are calculating the motion of the asteroid standard Pythagorean thing. And then we are going to be doing some plotting. This is what you should be getting and then more plotting because there are many different types of things that are there in the notebook you have. And then you can also find the complete list of values in case you want to go and plot something completely different. And so you can put limits on the minimum rate that you allow. And then this is the step that can take a little longer. So be patient when you run that one. And these are the values that you will want to change after you have tried the basic cells once. So this is where this part one will end. So maybe what you should do is that you should just go through that now and see that you do indeed get all of that. Yeah, here is something you may be getting an error and this is where you can try your Python skills a little bit. So at the top what we have done is we have defined the Astro Query JPL horizons as horizons and there are calls to horizons later. And this is where I had said we should change the HTTP to HTTPS, whereas the intermediate change that we made, we did not call it horizons. So the HTTPS change has happened for some part, but not for everything. So you can change it accordingly so that you in, in fact have the HTTPS part. 
right. So, later on when it was defined, redefined, it was redefined as JPL horizons, not horizons. So, that is the change that you will need to make. That is what that is, but so we had suggested how to change that and then we had a dynamic change that was suggested by <laughs> Leo and there is a slight conflict between that, but I think all the helpers now know about that. Yeah. No, it so in addition to that what I think Leo, so is it okay to change that can I just make this into horizons because that is how we have defined it at the top right. So, here we say import horizons oh, yeah. and yeah, so that is all that I am going to do. Yeah. So, so just delete that, Del delete that, delete the whole import because you've already imported it. Okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and then that should do work. Horizons, change that to capital H. It should work. Okay, and then just run that to make sure it's working. Oh, sure. Now uh, it doesn't. Yeah, so that won't <laughs> work because there's a difference between the module uh. and the so undo. So, where's the undo? Here, I can just yeah. rewrite it. I thought just re importing it as horizons may be the no, better thing. No, but way. you, um, so what you did up here is you imported the horizons class. Right. from the JPL right. Horizons module. Right. What we are trying to do is get at the conf object. Um, uh, so, so you could do from astro query dot JPL Horizons import conf like that. Oh, separately. Just do the conf. Okay. Yeah. Or you could do. Um, yeah, okay. That runs. That is fine. You yeah. could do from astro or you could do import astro query JPL horizons and then So, um, everyone, please look at the main screen. There was an important set of changes that was suggested, which I think should just explain. So, there are two things that are here, and you should use any one of them. Any one of them should be good. So, at the top, we had imported something else which did not have the HTTPS, and this solves for that. So, we have got HTTPS here in both, and just defining it should allow you to go through the rest of the cells quite easily. Because in the very next cell, in after this definition, there was a call to horizons which used the older HTTP. So, we have gone through step 1 now, everybody. So, did everybody get this figure? Please raise your hand if you did. Okay, others are still trying to get to that. We will wait one minute. So, this figure and the next figure, there is not much difference. We are simply changing some parameters there. And then there is a larger list that is available here which you can use. How many of you have now reached here getting the hit? Okay, about half of you. So, are there any issues that the others are facing? Okay. So, let us go to step 2 now. So, here what we are going to do is that we are going to compare catalog derived from step 1, right. We have a longer catalog there, we looked at only one object in it but the catalog itself is pretty big. And then what we are going to do is that look at some specific things from there, but 
we are not really going to use the entire catalog. So, if you get to the check FMO file that that is the second set second file that we have we have provided that is what is going to be used here. So, again there are a few formatting things and then you can get this table there which gives you some details of the asteroid that we are looking at the 2018 CL. Again these are fairly straightforward and then this is where you should be able to find the streak. Did you find the images where you are you have the streak? So, at least one person ran that search successfully without finding a streak. Without finding a streak. Yes. Okay. One more. Okay. And at least one person has found a streak. Okay. So, that is a bit curious. And that may have to do with the last cell that I mentioned earlier where you may need to do a little bit of tweak to get the right streak in. So, very likely the data subset that you have does contain the streak, but what we are doing in the last cell is plotting only one streak and that may or may not be the nearest one depending on how things are. So, that is that is going to be homework, but one thing there is that rather than plotting only one streak plot all the streaks that you have and that is going to contain the streak that we have. So, let me point out where it is. This is the streak if you get everything right, but if you do not get it quite right then you will see ok. Those who did not get the streak, but went through the last step what is it that they are saying they should still be seeing an image. No image at all, no streak I can understand that, but no image at all oh, that is interesting that is curious because there has to be an image some image. So, let me come and take a look there. Sometimes what happens is that what we are doing here is look at this line JPEGs of 0. So, we have a set of JPEGs and we are asking it to give us the first one that need not be the nearest one. In most cases if it is a single one that will be, but that is where you will have to look at if you are getting some image, but not the right image. But if you are not getting any image then I think we need to take a look at that something else may be happening there. So, if you are not getting an image one thing to check is the path of the run merge directory. It has been untarred in a specific location and there is a specific path that was provided. The assumption in the notebook was that it was one of your sub directory, but if it was not a sub directory it is, if it does not live where the notebook lives then you may need to change that path and then you should have access to those images. So, this is where either you change the path or as was stated by Igor move the run merge directory into the same directory as where the notebook is that may be the simplest at this point. And those of you who did get the streak they may want to try the other things that were mentioned before change the name of the asteroid, change some limits. So, that is when they should now try different things I guess. Did anyone try a different asteroid? Or within the file that has been generated by part 1 you can also look at some other asteroids in there. Yeah, we have got last few minutes those who already have the streaks make sure you try one of the other asteroids. Okay, some of you are getting a an image, but that is not of a streak. So, there what I mentioned in the last thing about the JPEG file that is where you need to make the change. So, if you are not getting this streak, if you change the JPEGs of 0 to JPEGs of 1 you are likely to find a different thing, you will find this one. So, what we are doing there is that we have a list of JPEGs, we are asking it to give us just the first one that is not really what we should be doing. 
what we should be doing is that we should be asking us to give us the one that is nearest. So you may want to modify the function at some point to give you the nearest one rather than the just the first one. You can do additional things as to figure out how many, how long the list of JPEGs is, maybe print all of them. So those are the easy modifications that you could try. Okay, for those of you who are looking for different asteroids, the way to decide the dates where to look would be the following. If you pick up that name in the MPC, in the Minor Planet Center, you will find the last date of observation. But besides that, you can also get the ephemerides of that object, which will give multiple dates. Whether ZTF was looking in that direction on that particular date, we do not know. So you may want to try a few of those dates if the first date does not match. Hopefully some of those you will be able to get to.